All right, we are live. So welcome to another Thursday edition of Q&A, Up My Hockey with the parent group. Today, we are doing something new. I am also broadcasting uh, to my own personal channel on Facebook. I got StreamYard going on here and trying a new version of it. So you'll have to bear with me on, uh, on some of the little nuances here. I can do fun stuff like this. Show banners. What do you know, right? So I can put this up. Visualization as a tool. This is all fancy. So yeah, we're getting we're getting her going here. And today we have on Cal Banazic. And uh, Cal is a long time uh, opponent, I guess we could say. Uh, we we've been battling between the boards for, for a while, and uh, Cal reached out a little while ago, and I wasn't aware that he was uh, working in Kelowna. So I remembered him from back in Medicine Hat and uh, and some other places along the hockey journey. But uh, it's amazing how this life works, Cal. That uh, you know sometimes commonalities bring us together, push us apart, and then bring us together again. So thanks so much for uh, for getting here after your tennis match and ripping back and being a, being a guest on today's show. Yeah, awesome. Great to be here. Sweet. Um, so, yeah, so Cal and I talked a little bit before. Cal has a really cool story, and and uh, and I want to get into that. And, and we'll talk about Cal kind of growing up as an athlete, how he got introduced to visualization, how it became a big part of his, you know, daily practice and goal setting and, and how it fit into his aspirations and uh, and his dreams. And uh, we'll get into his his, his uh hockey hockey playing journey and then also what he's doing now which is which is helping other people uh other athletes be able to reach for the stars and 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 using visualization as a tool to help them get there so um if that's all right with you cal maybe we'll get we'll get rolling yeah you bet cool and thanks for everyone coming here um i don't see who's on right now but if you want to say hi please do and again like always guys this is meant to be interactive so I am super, super curious about this topic visualization I have used. I cannot say that I am well, well versed in it. I would not claim myself to have expert status just on a on my own level and some, some of the stuff that I do with, with my clients. Uh, so I'm going to be asking a ton of questions. And if you guys have any questions, please do. So Cal, when did it all get rolling for you? I, I know a little bit. Maybe we'll start with the with the hockey school. Tell us about the hockey school and and how that how that workshop was a big uh, game changer for you. Yeah, so you know, at the time I was uh, living in Dawson Creek, and from small town, you don't have access to, you know, a lot of extra training or anything. And you know, since the time I was probably five, all I wanted to do was play hockey. And so, you know, I was lucky enough to have parents that could, you know, send me down to Okanagan Hockey School in Penticton. And so I would go down there, I think from the time I was probably 10 to 13-ish, 9 to 13-ish. And uh, at, I think it was 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old, uh, they had a guy come in and teach uh, just a, a two-day program on visualization. And when he was teaching it, immediately I, it, it kind of resonated with me somehow. I didn't like, I just, I, it was something different that I'd never heard of. And, uh, it was simple. He just, he basically just talked about it for, you know, maybe 10, 20 minutes, didn't get too much into detail. And he's like, okay, we're going to do it. And so we had all of us in, uh, we did the hockey school in an actual school. So we were just in a classroom. He had us all lying on, uh, on the ground. And he got into the breathing part and he walked us through a guided visualization and immediately something clicked with me. Like I could see the pictures in my head and I think I actually went and asked him afterwards. I'm like, oh man, like I saw like a whole movie playing in my head and he's like, that's exactly what you're looking for. And, um, so he actually, when I was talking to him, he su suggested a book to me, which kind of became the foundation of me developing uh, a program for myself and that book uh, still available um, you know Tony Robbins claims it as his you know big mentor book and it's called psycho cybernetics I think by Max uh, Maxwell Martz and it it basically teaches you how your brain works and how to utilize it optimally and it, it was a heavy read for you know 11 12 year old sure but I, I was so interested in it 
that I got through it and uh, I've actually passed it on now to uh, to my kids and I'm trying to you know get them involved in it as well um, with their dance but instantly it, it was something that I was like I'm gonna try this so right when I left hockey school I was there for two weeks I think mm -hmm. I went home and at the time I was uh, golfing quite a bit I was getting involved in junior golf and I really loved it so I spent my summers like a lot of hockey players you know, on the course and, uh, I'd never won a tournament or anything, but the week after I got home from hockey school, it was, uh, I think mid end August, beginning September, uh, I'd played tournaments before, but never won. And so before this tournament, right after hockey school, I just, I played the course. All I did was the night before I visualized playing every single hole. So first tee box, step up, hit my drive, step up to the next shot and just played the course in my mind. And went out the next day and won the tournament. And that's when something really went off. And I'm like, okay, there's 100% something to this. And I bought in immediately. And, you know, with everything that happened, it, it literally changed my life. That is super, super cool. Yeah, I mean, and that was well ahead of its time. It won 08, that Okanagan Hockey School, I was uh, I, I was there. I, oh, I was no. a member there. And uh and it was it was just a great camp. I mean, they did a great job there, and and uh, and bringing something like that in, like boy, that would have been like eighty five ish, like maybe yeah. eighty eight. You know, what I mean, that was pretty new age at the time, and it's new age even right now. And, and you know, I'm going to call out some of the members of of my group because I I put on a question yesterday. You know, I announced that you you were coming on, and I put on a question inside the group. I said, "Let me know your questions on visualization," you know, so I can ask them. And we're talking 850 people in this group, right? It was in up there for almost 30 hours, and no one asked a question. Well, minus my wife, she 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 chimed in and uh, and asked some questions. So like that was interesting to me because it was like, well, either people aren't interested, or they're maybe afraid because they don't know what it is or don't even know what to ask, right? So, well, and that's, you know, like I've been teaching this system to, you know, athletes around the Okanagan for the last uh, 10 years. And it's, it's a tough sell initially because people don't know what you're talking about. This isn't a topic that's spoke about. Mm -hmm. uh, professional athletes tend to hold on to their own personal systems. And there's a whole bunch. Uh, there's a really good book called Mind Gym uh, where uh, the author talks about how he worked with NBA players, hockey players, uh, Tiger Woods, tennis players, all these guys who I never heard of these guys ever talking about it anywhere else other than this book. Yeah. And, you know, I thought about it and I'm like, why – why is it not out in the open? And I think it's something that's so personal that people have their own little thing and they're afraid to talk about it. I started trying to talk about it at the end of my, I played pro hockey for 10 years and the last few years when I knew I was transitioning out and I'm like, well, I have nothing to, you know, I'm trying to help the young guys. I'm not trying to like, you know, compete with everyone at that level. It's like, you know, I want to pass on. And so I started talking about it a little bit in the dressing room and most guys, again, either had their own little personal thing that they weren't really willing to share because it was so personal because they're like, they didn't want anyone criticizing it because athletes, we become real superstitious about the things that have made us successful sometimes too, mm. which helps us feel confident and good. But at the same time, we also are sometimes afraid like, Oh, I don't want to jinx it. I'm having success. I don't want to share some, my, my personal, recount of what I do for visualization and have somebody go, oh, that's stupid or, yeah. you know, that's nonsense. And then all of a sudden, maybe I start entering a little bit of doubt in my head, sure. which, you know, as a professional athletes, you know, the killer of all killers. Yeah. I mean, you know, judgment can come in, right? Like you mentioned, you I mean, are they going to judge me? Is anyone else even doing this? You mean, you assume they are, but you're not sure. Uh, it's this, you know, macho kind of environment. And now you're getting into nuanced kind of mind stuff. Like there's, there's a lot of elements there that I think people aren't, uh, you know, that willing to, to share, but let me tell you, don't be fooled. Everyone's doing something. If you're successful, you I mean, those guys at that level and you I mean, you're talking tennis and golf, like those are 
instant locks on on visualization and, and hockey is definitely ranks up there you're a professional athlete these guys are these guys have some type of system process that they're doing uh vigilantly you know that that's helping them out uh you mentioned dance and i was just curious because i heard that so are your daughters or your son or daughters dancers yeah both my girls dance and uh i've actually uh i go in and do presentations even for their dance studio about how to prepare for competition uh because really when you're going into a game or in dance it's like you know you have competitions only like four or five of them so they're like very intense and you have basically one shot and yeah. it's your group and everyone's relying on you so if you can do the mental stuff beforehand right you know you've put the practice in you've gotten good sleep you got good hydration you've put the athletic work in your you, everything's good now if you can just get your mind on board to be like Hey, look, I've done everything possible to prepare for this moment now. I can show up at the rink for hockey and relax. There's nothing else I can do. I can't do anything two hours before the game that's going to make my hands better, going to make you know my, uh, my skills, but all those things. It's like what I have going into the game is what I have. I just need to do it at 100%. And yeah. then I can look at myself in the mirror at the end of it and be like, win or lose, I know I was prepared and I went out there and competed how I wanted to on my terms. Yeah. So no, that's great. And uh, I, I'm, I was curious about that because my wife is a, was a professional dancer for like 10 years in LA. She moved, she moved to LA at 18 to pursue her, a, a dance career and okay. um, booked her first job was Austin Powers, which was crazy and like was super successful ever since. And now she's mentoring young dancers here, here in Vernon and, and online. And, uh, and she definitely uses the visualization herself. I think she was more like me, like we we sort of stumbled onto it and knew we needed to do it. But she definitely used it in her prep and to and to you know to kind of crystallize the routine of how that's supposed to feel and everything else. And now she's passing that on to to her dancers. So it's interesting you're walking into that dance studio because a hundred percent it applies to dancers as well. There's almost no really no places where it does where it doesn't apply. Yeah, and and you know like what I told the girls is you know you you have the dance you practiced it you know for months right. You can, you can practice it at home in your head, walking through it, seeing your lines. How's your face? Like you're watching yourself. You're visualizing an image of yourself. Like what's your presentation? How's your, your you know, like in, in dance, it's very expressive if you're like doll face. The dance, even if you're dancing it perfectly, doesn't come across and connect with the audience. Whereas if you're, you know, you got all the moves and you don't have to think about the moves because they're on lock because you visualize that routine so much that it's like, I know it inside out. I can just not even think about it and do it. Now I can concentrate on the little things that are going to make a difference to be, am I elite? Am, am I connecting now with the audience? Am I exuding all the things that I want to tell in that story of dance to the audience? And that's where the impact is. You know, I've watched lots of beautiful dancers go up and give flawless performances, but if it doesn't connect, then there's a whole big piece missing, right? Yeah. Because they're so, you know, oh, I got to nail this move and nail this move, and there's a disconnect, right? right. So if no, you, 100%. If you visualize and you have everything so, you know, confident in yourself, like, okay, I've, I've prepared. I got it all. I know it inside out. Now I can go and actually perform it. Right. Well, there's actually uh, like the science is even pointing, which I'm sure you can probably speak more eloquently to than I, but that that you're actually seriously training your brain. It's not it's not a matter of, you know, you. Well, it is a matter of the athlete feeling more confident. Right. There's there's a realness to that. Right. That whether that's fake or contrived or whatever, like you actually feel it. And that's going to that's going to add to your you know, to your performance, whether that be on the ice or whether that be anywhere, but you've actually trained the neurons in the brain to make right. that connection, right? Like you're, you're, you're doing that because the brain can't tell the difference. Like it's being proved between the actual sure. doing it and, and the, the make believe aspect of seeing it in your brain. So it's, it's such like a powerful tool to really take advantage of because we can't be on the ice all the time, or we can't be, you know, on the dance stage on the time all the time, but we do have these opportunities, whether it's before bed or whether it's exactly. you know when you get up in the morning or whatever it is, driving in the car, where you have an opportunity to to still be working your craft if you want to spend the time and know how to do it. You know, and and you know, we grew up in a little bit different time. Like I grew up in a small town, so I had plenty of ice time, right? But nowadays, 
some even rep teams, Pee Wee, you might get on the ice for two practices and a game a week. That's three times. You and I tell the you know the kids I train. Every time you visualize is a practice. You don't have to you don't have to visualize a game every time. I visualize my skills. I want to see myself in, increase, you know, my hand speed or my softness, my accuracy in my shooting, my, you know, reading the ice. I can do so many things in my brain, you know, and it's, it's, I, it doesn't require any money. It requires me laying in bed and seeing myself practice. And in fact, you know, getting back to something you said there, when I would visualize before hockey games and I did it, from the time uh, Bantam, I would visualize the night before, and then game uh, day, I would do a little, little tiny one, it, you know, just to sharpen everything up. It was probably the same time, but I treated it like this isn't going to be, you know, as intense as the one I did night before, and like it, it just, it. The, the, again, getting back to the science, when you are visualizing, like you said, you're actually building those neural pathways. They've measured it. So I always describe it, the analogy, if you visualize a skill once, say it's a new skill, and I actually did this. I tried this on myself uh, about 10 years ago. I took a hula hoop, had a hula hoop for my girls, never hula hoop before, and watched a, a, a YouTube video on hula hooping. Never yeah. done it before. So I sat there, I watched. I took about 15 minutes, visualized, you know, this trick she did, which was she did it around her head, then she walked through it and right back up. And first time I tried it after 15 minutes of visualization, I nailed it. Never done it before. Right. <laughs> so the analogy I give is the first time you visualize a skill, it's like walking up to a forest and, you know, beating a footpath through the forest. So now you have a walking trail. Right. The second time you visualize it's like you've pounded in that trail. Maybe you can take a mountain bike on it now. Still a little bit rough. Third time, maybe it's as wide as a car. You can four by four or something. Yeah. The fourth, fifth, sixth time, it's like now you got a paved road. By the 20th time you visualize that thing, you have an autobahn. You know, yeah. it's, it's a path. And that's exactly what's going on in your brain. They've shown you're actually building those dendrites and they expand like a, it looks like a tree branch. Yeah. And you're literally building your brain. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I, I've had a post in the group called my, uh, about myelination and M Mike Sullivan, head coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins at last year's uh, coaching NHL coaches conference had a presentation on the brain and mindset and, and how he believes it's the next frontier in sports. And he talked about myelination and that's the essentially the insulation of the neurons and the pathways that, that makes them conduct quicker and faster. And, and that visualization is a huge portion of that. That's uh, just, uh, I wanted to mention something earlier too, when you were talking about guys, you know, not not sharing their program. Uh, when I give my presentation, I, I've done it for a bunch of BC junior teams and stuff. So uh, I have a PowerPoint and I pulled a whole bunch of pictures off of uh, the NHL playoffs that year. And so I, I put these pictures, maybe about 10 pictures up. And there's Sidney Crosby in the stands with his eyes closed. There's Daniel Briere in the dressing room with his head down, eyes closed. And at the end of these 10 pictures, I say, do you, guys, do you guys think these guys are sleeping in the dressing room or in the stands before the game, before one of the biggest games of their entire life? You know, and it's like, no, they are running through. You like, you'll even see guys in the stands after they tape their stick sitting there and they're actually, you know, like moving around with, you know, they're going through my face offs, my D zone, you know, different things that I'm expecting from other guys on the team. You know, if I got a Jason Padolin coming down, I know, hey, guy's quick. I have to maybe give him a little bit more space, make sure I'm looking at him in the chest and, you know, have my stick in the right position, driving him wide. Right. I'm going to think of those things to play, you know, against a guy so that when I, again, go out on the ice, there's no time to think. If you're thinking about what you're doing on the ice, getting back to my elation, the thinking is slowing you down. And you're going to have slow reactions. You're going to be gripping your stick a little bit tighter. You need to go out there nice and relaxed. Every muscle is going to move faster, more precise, and you're going to be probably getting close to playing in the zone. Right. No, 100%. Yeah, I, I, uh, 
pumped you said Daniel Briere because I don't know if you knew, but he was like my third or fourth podcast guest. I did. And, uh, when I actually, uh, I met Briere in uh, Phoenix camp. I went to Phoenix camp uh, on a trail. What an amazing human being, just an yeah. absolute gentleman. And if anyone is listening who hasn't listened to that episode, like it is, for me, it was like, wow, because he was able to explain how he used everything off the ice to be able to make him be an NHL player on the ice. Like he wasn't able to bridge that gap, but he had to, he had to do the, the mind gym stuff, the mental gymnastics to be able to believe that he was supposed to be there. And he got even into the nuance of like how, what he would do before a game and how, how he was, he would revisualize or, or rewind every single goal he had for the entire season. Like he started with one. And then if he ended up with 30, like that was part of his pregame preparation the night before watching every goal he would focus on a couple of things anyways he got really detailed about like you said his his process that that was helped by a sports psychologist in his case that got him to uh to really be the nhl all-star and, and the unbelievable performer that he was and, and he said he went through that um once he learned that like his second year pro he he never stopped doing it and he's a yeah. massive advocate for uh for the mind stuff so it's interesting you, you included him in that in that piece well, there. you know there's a guy that you know probably nine out of 10 scouts would write off if they took a look at him and be like, there's no way this guy can play. Like he's going to get brutalized. Yeah. You know, if I remember correctly, I think at our, uh, at camp when we were doing like the bench press, I think he had to take weights off, you know, because, you know, there was a few of those smaller guys that weren't strong, but yeah. then they go on the ice and they're the best players on the ice. Yeah. Right. They have, you know, that level of, you know, yeah, he, he was five nine, like one or five eight, maybe like one sixty kind of yeah. stuff, like his draft year and one hundred and sixty points in the queue. And anyways, it ended up being an unbelievable. He almost won the con Smythe. He led the playoffs in points one year. Like it was a, like that. I love his story. Like guys like that, that get her done, that are little yeah, guys and use every attribute available to them. Right? Like he, you, he had to go there, and he did go there, uh, meaning the mind. And um, and look what it turned out to him. For I was like such a such a fan of that interview but okay so let's get back to you so you you mentioned to me that you end up moving to pg and like and you you kind of were thinking the game different like you said you started doing it in bantam you felt that, that was a big game changer for you um and then even where it took you after that going to the bcj where where we have a funny story there to share but like talk a little bit more about that and how it applied to you as a hockey player yeah so we ended up moving to uh to prince george for hockey and uh i got there and I was coming from, you know, small town Dawson Creek where I was, you know, kind of our star player. And big wake-up call right away, I was cut, like right down from A, B, and right to house. Um, and, you know, like I ended up, you know, talking to the guys uh, later on that season. They were like, yeah, you had no chance. The team was picked beforehand. And um, I actually went down to house and in the first – Two months, and it was devastating. I actually remember crying in my room for at least three, four days until my mom came down and said, you know, is that it? Like, this is all you wanted to do? You know, are you quitting? Is that? And so I said, no, I'll, you know, pick up my crap and, and get back out there. So I went out in, in Bantam House, and I made it my goal to play the best I could. So I went down there, and it was unfortunate. I ended up just destroying everybody. Like, after a month, they're like, we can't have this kid down here anymore. Like this is brutal. He's, you know, <laughs> hurting guys. Like I was running guys. I was scoring goals. I was doing everything. I got yeah. called back up to the uh, rep team and uh, was MVP by the end of the year. And, um, you know, I was heavily using that process at that time. The same year I went off uh, to BC junior golf championship and just using the visualization uh won won that tournament so i was bc junior champ uh and still pushing hockey hockey was my number one thing right and uh just kept seeing success and i i just couldn't let it go and it, it literally put me everywhere in athletics that i've gotten in my life that's wild. So you were a 15 year old kid in band. I mean, we, it's one of the things I talked about in this group and in my mindset 101 is about being able to like reframe your, your experience, right. To, to give a meaning to it that is going to be advantageous to you. Right. And so you had one of those opportunities there where, you know, like naturally you're, you're a human being, you felt sorry for yourself. You felt bad. You felt like, you know, people weren't giving you a chance. I'm sure you could have played the victim role, you know, for a while and did. And then you're just like, nope pulled yourself up by the bootstraps and decided to just to dominate 
and use that as an advantage and you know and and off you went which i think is amazing uh, and also that you're like a 15 year old kid that's actually consciously recognizing that I have an advantage over everybody else with this thing that I'm doing that I'm calling wow. visualization that nobody else is even talking about. We would probably think you're crazy if you did. And I never shared it. You know, like I'm one of those guys. It was like, I'm like, nobody's talking about this. Am I the only one doing this? Is this really weird? You yeah. know, like, so it was, it was personal, but at every stage I just, I couldn't deny the success I was having and I'm not I'm not a super athlete in fact I was probably not as gifted as uh, as a lot of guys um, but I had an insane belief in myself because I was always confident going into you know any any uh, thing I was doing that I was prepared and I could go out there and I I prided myself on not having a good game having a bad game you know right. down on the roller coaster you know I could keep it you know, at the same level every time going in, being confident and then just displaying what I had, which was, you know, whatever skill I, I had at the time. Right. But what I love about that is, and for me, like the personal connection r runs like alarm bells are going off is that when you use your mind properly and you use visualization properly, there's nothing that you haven't done. You know what I mean? Like there like I, I've I've told the story on here a little bit, but that my trade to uh, Toronto it was like a massive, massive one opportunity <clears throat> and a failed opportunity for me, going from the minors to to uh, Maple Leaf Gardens, right, and walking in that dressing room and wearing the Maple Leaf, and and not I hadn't gone there in my brain, right? I'd thought about being an NHL player and thought I was supposed to be there, but I I hadn't lived that moment, right? And even if it was a surprise scenario, like I could have been living that moment on the plane, right? I could have been living that moment about what that was going to be like tomorrow and meeting Matt Sundin and what I was going to do and, you know, to prepare myself to step into that locker room and to feel like I belonged, right? Because when you actually do walk into something for the first time that you've never done and you've never done it up here before, you're yeah. lost, right? You're lost. You know, and, and I'll tell you this, this was something that, you know, was really tough for me uh, you know, in my career when I really figured this out. So I had a superstition that eventually limited me. And that was within my visualization, uh, you know, that I did and I continued to do. Uh, and it, like, I'll just give an example. The one thing that I remember I started out my first visualization in Bantam was as a defenseman, getting the puck back in the neutral zone. You know, I'd have the puck and I was visualizing my options my d-man for a d to d pass you know get my head up my wingers are they swinging and if i had nothing if i was getting pressured up off the glass you know neutral zone and i'd visualize that thing so many times like you know building those neural networks i don't think i ever made a mistake in junior probably nearly not even in pro it was just that thing i'd visualize probably a thousand times right and I almost never made a mistake on it. But at the end of my visualization, here's my superstition. I said to myself, right when it was done and right before I'd go to bed, I said, I want to make it to the NHL. That was my mantra. And I did that. I was drafted. I went off to camp, sat in dressing rooms with LaFontaine, Howard Chuck, uh, Fuhr, when I got there, I had the same feeling you had when you got to Maple Leaf Garden. This is new because I had only said to myself, I want to make the NHL. Here I am. I made it. I'm here. Yeah. I'm sitting in the room. And afterwards, and, you know, like, I was like, I can't believe it. I should have said, I want to have a career in the NHL. I want to be an all-star in the NHL. I want to win a Stanley Cup. You know, those are all things that I wished that I had included and changed, but I fell into some superstition things because again, I built this program when I was 13 years old, right? right. With nobody around, you know, telling me, Hey, you gotta, you gotta evolve some things. You gotta get rid of, you know, some things that aren't serving you anymore. And I did build upon it, but that was one thing that I kept at the end that I never lost. And, uh, I think it was probably mentally the, you know, glass ceiling that I'd put for myself. So when I got there, I was just like, 
holy shit, like, should I get these guys autographs? It wasn't yeah. like, I belong here. Even though I had an unbelievable camp. I played on the same uh, team as Howard Chuck. I was second on our uh, squad team in scoring. I'd scored my first shift. Howard Chuck wins the puck back, one step to the middle, and shot above his shoulder, beating Hashik. And yeah. it was funny because there's another thing. That moment, and I've had a couple of these where it's like, deja vu i visualize these things so many times that in a game it's like i see it and it's like something locks in it's like i've seen this yeah and the puck comes back and i do the thing and it works so perfect and i remember a couple times like scoring and not being like yeah i was like whoa like that's <laughs> really weird <laughs> right, right right you know that's powerful stuff and um yeah i mean i've alluded to that myself i mean i my my goal was to make the nhl i played 41 games you know i, I made it but i had never i never changed that you know that that idea of what making it really is wow. tom laidlaw a past guest on my podcast played 10 years in the nhl he said the same thing like very proud of what he did and, and showing up every day to go to work but he never really changed the bar for himself like he just he had himself as being an nhl journeyman defenseman and that's what he turned into like he always said like now he says god i wish i would have said i should have been an nhl all-star like why wasn't i shooting for all-star why was i just content to be there right so it's interesting kind of the boxes we put ourselves in or maybe even like the thinking that we we unknowingly put ourselves in right that's kind of holding us back sometimes but yeah um so we ended up playing to get each other which is a funny story we'd like you to tell us we were in the bcj uh, Cal has is a late birthday, uh, 77. I'm a 76 early birthday. So we were only like four months apart, but kind of a whole year of hockey apart. So I was playing in the BCJ at 15 years old and, and Cal was 16 and, and, uh, Cal, I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, as a 16 year old, I didn't get in the lineup very much. I was six foot. I think one, the program said 160. I bet you it wasn't more than probably 152. <laughs> uh, so I was, you know, honestly, I was scared a lot. And, uh, but when I got in the game, you know, I was like, I'm a big mean, that was my persona because I was a big kid. I had to play tough, you know, back in those days, it was, it was tough, tough hockey. And, uh, so his first game playing the great Paul Korea heard about him, you know, the year before, like, oh, this guy lit up the league, 150 points, whatever he had. And so for whatever reason, um, you know, I got in this game. I only played 22 games that, uh, that first year. I ate hot dogs and popcorn and every other, every <laughs> rink in the BC League. Uh, but I worked my butt off and I became an all-star the next year. Uh, but that particular game, me and Korea got tied up in the corner. And for some reason, we were like, we'd fell down. So we were coming up the ice really late. And right in front of your guys' bench, for I have no idea why, I just straight up cross-checked Korea from behind, just send a message. I'm like, and uh, the very next shift, uh, the puck, I remember it well because my it was my sister's first game that she came to. And so it's a defensive zone. I'm in uh, the middle in front of the goalie, and I was lined up against you, actually. And the puck dropped, and I just felt somebody grab my shoulder, turn me around, and pop me in the face. My nose exploded all over my face mask, and we had a good go. And that was my first fight. So <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, you know what? I wish I had a better memory because I wonder. I mean, I only fought two or three times that year, and 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 I that might have been my first fight too. Very well could have been. We we both we both were virgins up till then. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so yeah, awesome story. I mean, and for those who missed that, like that was Paul Korea who ended up being future Hall of Famer Paul Korea. Uh, now retired and you know, just an amazing player. And so he was, I think, 16 or 17 year olds too at the time. I think he was a 70, a late 77. Yeah. No, he was a late 70. Uh, I mean, a late 74, I think is what he was. But anyways, yeah. unbelievable. He, he would be your older, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was an honor to play with him that year in, in Penticton. But that's a funny story. So, yeah, so, Cal, like – Kind of, it seems like, I mean, I love that story too, you know, like go to Prince George, cut down to house, fight your way back, make BCJ as a 16 year old, which is an honor, but get, yeah. you know, you're eating hot dogs, you're 22 games, could have felt sorry for yourself, but step in the next year, turn into an all-star, go to the, go to Medicine Hat the following year, um, end up getting drafted and you wore the C for that team, did you not? Yeah, uh, two years later, as a 20-year-old, uh, I captained the Tigers. And, uh, you know, I loved the organization, still have some contact with them. And 
you know, as you know, the Western League was, you know, it was unbelievably brutal back in those days as far as, you know, toughness and uh, fighting. And, you know, you really had to prepare every game. We had four or five, sometimes six guys in the stands at the beginning of the year for, waiting for your spot. And the coach was, he, he was, you know, straight up with you, like in practice, like, hey, you don't want to compete? You will be in the stands. It was easy to get in the doghouse. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful the three years I was there, I, I never sat in the stands. I was always, you know, uh, a gamer and uh, I was proud about that. Well, you were definitely a gamer. I, I remember, I mean, we didn't play against you often because you were in the different conference, but uh, you were even the guy in like the all-star game that would just like be hacking somebody or, you know, sticking somebody like, because uh, Cal and I played in the same all-star game, the WHL too. And you just had that way about you. I mean, you were kind of all, you were all business all the time. I mean, it's always what I remembered about you. And I think you took that seriously, Ben, but, but good on you because like, you know, it's good to know. And I talk with that about my athletes sometimes is one do- don't sell yourself short, but but understand too, like where you're at. You I mean you you were saying that maybe you weren't the most gifted guy, and you probably found that you know what I gotta. I'm, this is the way I'm gonna have to play if I'm gonna make a career out of this. You know I mean I got, I have to find this edge and be make, make sure that I'm ready every game, and not everybody's willing to do that. You know to make a career of it. So you I mean I give you credit for, for that. Uh, do you have any other stories from your first, um, you know, from from the camps there in Buffalo, or you I mean what those what those experiences were like? Uh, yeah, you know it was. The hockey, actually, as you go up levels, I was really surprised that playing at the NHL level was the easiest hockey I played. Yeah. Um, you know, it was interesting that the first game I had up there, uh, it was an easy neutral zone regroup. Puck came back to me, and uh, Howard Chuck came down through the middle. I gave him a nice tape to tape pass. He went up the ice, we broke in, and uh. I thought everything was fine. Uh, after the shift, he comes down, sits with me at the end of the bench, and he's like, uh, hey, you know, just in that play, he's like, I don't know if you noticed, I had my stick in a certain position, basically telling you that I didn't want the puck. The pluck play was developing. And, you know, I wanted to wait, and then my winger was going to come off the wall, and then we were going to come up with a little bit more speed, a little bit more group together. And uh, that's when it really went off in my head. I'm like, oh, like there's now levels to this. I was an 18 year old at camp. Right. And, uh, you know, that's when I was like, OK, like I have to really start to study the game as well, because there's a whole bunch of parts of it. It's not just like me protecting the front of the net, getting pucks up to my wingers and breaking up the ice. There's now second and third layers to this game that I have to start developing. And that's when I really started actually putting together, you know, working on my hands, working. I ended up, you know, working my way onto the power play the next year, being first line power play guy, uh, you know, my last year, and then went off to Europe and then was counted on to put up points as a, as an import. Um, And so, you know, it's really important that if you're good at something that's great but there's so many different parts to the game like take a look and the easiest way again to do it you don't have all the ice time in the world is just visualizing yourself developing those parts of the game and that's that's partially how i kept improving was just the amount of visualization i tried counting and i have for surely over ten thousand hours you know in the visualization game because i was doing it four, five, six, seven, eight, ten times a week, basically since the time I was 13. That's awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, so good, too, because like I said, it was before your time. So now you, here you are. You've been using this yourself. And um, I mean, I, I do want to get to the visualization. We, had, we, we, got, we got 20 minutes left. I'd like to go over the hour, and, and I want to get into some visualization questions. But like fast – Fast forward through the 10 years pro, fast forward through the two championships, you know, in Europe that, that you use this from. And I don't want to discount that by any means. But what I think is another interesting level of this is that when you got out of hockey now 
and now you decide to play some tennis and like tell a story about how you like how you set up visualization even with the goals because we haven't gotten into like even like how to really use this visualization but just yep. explain explain to the listeners here and and i got this is super cool because i'm back in the comments and there's some some guys that played for me last year carter's in here and pierce is here and so hi guys thanks everyone for tuning in i please listen be curious about this stuff if you have any questions like this is the time ask the questions I, I always encourage all players of all ages to be curious right really listen ask the questions and and soak it all up because it's such a such an advantage to have somebody here like cal who's who's gone through this and has used it to his advantage and now is teaching others how to do it so anyways um about tennis uh, cal please please tell yeah, so uh well i bought this house uh just over i guess 11 years ago and uh it's got a tennis court right out the backyard and uh so i didn't even the first three years when i lived here i didn't play tennis i never played tennis ever uh but it was a buddy of mine and you know we were over here having barbecue or something he's like hey why don't we you know you got a court out there why don't we start playing we'll play once a week and i'm like yeah that's cool i'd love to you know that'd be that'd be fun so me and him started together and uh immediately you know, we, we kind of got competitive with each other, but we only played each other net. Like I didn't know anybody else who played tennis. So it was like me and him every week. And then, uh, the next year I'm like, I actually kind of like this. I'm going to start putting some work. And so I was going out there every once in a while and practicing by myself. Yeah. And that, that second year, I really started loving it. Like, I'm like, Oh, this is a brand new challenge. I have, I have no basis in it. I have no ego. There's no expectation of anything. I just love it. And, uh, so I started working on it and immediately I started visualizing my play. So I would watch YouTube videos and, uh, and just start copying it. And I was visualizing, probably started out about two, three times a week. Uh, and I saw my game getting better and better. And that third year, so I was still a, a real beginner, but I'm like, I'm going to try to compete. You know, and so I contacted the head pro here in town and uh, there was a local tournament. I said, hey, I want to come out and play a tournament. And he's like, what's your, uh, you know, how many years have you been playing? And I'm like, one. And he's like, uh, okay, so you go in, you know, the starter, you know, uh, it's called 3.5. Yeah. And so I said, okay, yeah, showing up. And uh, I ended up winning that, that, that tournament, you know, at the lower level. So it's like basically yeah. C division tennis. Yeah. And, uh, so then I ended up meeting him. I said, Hey, like, I'd like a lesson. So I've had a lesson with him at least one or two a year for the, since I started. And that was eight years ago. And, um, last year I won BC provincials, uh, for tennis. I ended up ranking on uh, my age group, which was 40 plus, uh, by the end of the years, for sure. I played all the tennis Canada tournaments, Westerns, two provincials and nationals. And I got the third in the country, and now I'm 200th in the world, and planning on going to Worlds in uh, Croatia this September. Well, that's I mean, one that's super amazing. But like, please tell, like, didn't didn't you were telling me um, when we met a couple of weeks ago, like how you how you kind of made that part of your vision board or your goal? Like you you yep. made this audacious kind of statement to yourself, saying, "Hey, I'm going to whatever win provincial." I can't remember what it was, right? But then you actually visualized yourself doing that. Like what what was what was that process for you in that in that sense? So again, during uh, and we'll go over here at the end, just my actual visualization process. So oh, well, I can do it right now. So the first part of it is just laying in your bed, and it's like you can call it meditation. You're just trying to breathe, slow your breathing down, slow your mind down, and you really want to get it to basically an empty space. And for some people, that's very difficult. So, you know, when I work with clients, that's one of the things we have. We have, you know, some techniques to get around, you know, not having like, oh, I have homework or I got to, you know, for the kids, you know, or I, I have, you know, work tomorrow, I have this. And you have all these thoughts trying to invade your brain and you have little techniques just to like, quiet that down. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, discovered a cheat to all that by using binaural beats, which is just some audio that you put in and it changes your brain waves instantly. And so after you relax, I do a pre-visualization, which is, uh, I call it my trophy room, which I go through and I visually see past uh, successes. And I, I have pictures up in, you know, in my mental wall of, you know, hockey championships, you know, draft any, and even a game that I had that was like uh, something special to me. I have those pictures 
you know, up around this room. And then I have three uh, rotating pictures that I always have a short term, a mid term and a long term goal. And I see myself as having accomplished it. And when I go, you know, in my mind and I'm looking at those pictures, the important thing is getting all your five senses involved. So it's like you've already done it. You can, you know, taste, you know, the sweat. You can smell the air that, you know, is in this picture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much work you put in it, the pride that went into accomplishing that, all those things. And then after that, I go through my trophy room. Um, I actually do a little bit more meditation just to bring myself down because I'll find when I'm starting to visualize, I'll get tense because your body starts to actually react. So sometimes I'll start getting really tense, right. you know, imagining some of these, you know, hard, you know, games or something. Um, so I got to relax. And then there's another portion of that just to touch on where, uh, I actually have a garbage can and I see myself just getting rid of all my, you know, um, jealousy especially in hockey you'd be sometimes you'd be jealous to other players they're getting more success or whatever or there's a guy in the team that on the other side that you know you might be scared of and i would just take that fear and i'd throw it in the garbage or maybe you know he cheaped me last game and i'm like so mad at him but i don't want to take a bad penalty or something so i'll get rid of that like you know that hate or you know whatever feelings i had that were going to be negative and right. acting against me i would just throw all those out and then the last part of the visualization is your sport. So for hockey, I would see myself from the moment I showed up to the rink, walking in the doors, hanging up my, uh, you know, suit, putting on my warm up gear, doing my warm up, putting on all my equipment, going out, having a good pregame uh, skate. And then I would go right into uh, my game. And for tennis, it was the exact same thing. I just kept the same process, you know, putting up in my mid short, uh, and long-term vision uh, goals, seeing those pictures. And one of the pictures for tennis that I did last year was me holding, you know, the cup above my head. I hadn't won, you know, a giant tournament. I'd won some, you know, local. I'd won some, I think I'm three-time Vernon, you know, champ. And I've won at Predator. And I've won some local tournaments out and around. But I'd never stepped up onto, like, the provincial or national scale. And so I just kept seeing myself with this cup. And I would, I would do it even outside. So like in my showers, after I'm finished showering, at the end of my shower, I'd throw my hands up and see myself with that cup. And so the other goal, my long-term goal last year uh, that I had up on the wall was to make number three in Canada. And I thought this is ridiculous. Like this, I, I'm, I'm not even ranked. Like, but I'm like, I'm going to put a goal out there and see if I can hit it. And uh, so for a short, hot week with the points that I'd accumulated at nationals, I hit number three. Uh, and then subsequently, there were some more tournaments out east and some guys, you know, leapfrogged me. But I'm still sitting top 10 in Canada right now. And, uh, you know, I'm still trying to make some noise out here. That's awesome. That's so cool. From unranked to, to believing, dreaming that you could be top three and seeing it. And being yeah. as extensive as like holding this cup up in your bathroom, you know, and like guys, that sounds crazy to some people. I know there's people sitting here going, that guy's nuts. Right. But like it, it, there's the beauty of it is, is that it works. It's real. It works. Right? Like it works. It's real. It's been proven. Like there's, there's, there's studies like university studies. Have you, have you seen that free throw study? That basketball yeah, study? Exactly. Yeah. That was one of the ones I quote to all my guys. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, where I guess we don't need to get into. It. I we got other stuff, but it, anyways, like the visualization in in like a triple blind study, like it 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 uh, made these guys better free throw shooters than the guys that just practiced and the, the guys that only uh, or did nothing. Obviously, yeah, like they outperformed kind of, the guys that actually practiced. Yeah, they outperformed the guys that practiced yeah. um, just by doing it in their head. So, yeah. it, I mean, there's something to this, right? And and it should be a part of every serious athlete's um, preparation and and game plan. And and I'm gonna get into a couple of questions. I thought my wife actually asked some great ones. Uh, one was. It, when is the best time to visualize? If you're going to get into visualization process, when, when would that be? Yep. So the the best time is actually before you go to sleep, because the brain waves that you're trying to get to, uh, and I won't get into the whole details about that, but you're trying to get into the theta state, which is what they call a super learning state. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you're basically able to download the information your brain is optimally building not only that like i said when i'm visualizing if i'm hitting forehands i'll be laying totally relaxed and i'll feel like my arms like just microscopically flexing like it's reacting to the thing so my mind's got the pictures i'm running around you know doing whatever here but my body's actually physically on a real tiny level reacting and right. especially in the western league when i was going into games because it was so intense you know it was so tough i was you know there am i going to be fighting tonight are there guys coming after me like i would literally be so tense that everything would be totally flexed and i'd have to be like <sighs> and it might take me five seconds just to relax all my muscles again so that i could get back to uh you know the point in thing yeah, no, no kidding. So yeah, so so b before a game, and that was, I mean, that's exactly what Danny Breer said. He said the night before a game was really when this, when this starts, right? Like yeah. is, is is when it starts. Your pregame preparation should start the night before. Um, and, and sorry, just to touch on it. So the theta state is the state just before delta, which is sleeping. And when you're doing the visualization, a lot of times, like when I do it for my clients, I do a guided visualization. So I'm actually the one you know, talking about, you know, you're now receiving the puck in the corner, you're going back shoulder checking, now you're wheeling the net, you got your head up, you see the winger, you take a hard stride up, hit him tape to tape pass, uh, and actually guide them through it. But when you're doing it on your own, um, it takes a little bit. And to be honest, to this day, I've done it, like I said, over 10,000 times. And there's sometimes when I fall through that theta state to the delta, and I actually go to sleep. And, you know, wake up the next morning and I'll be like, oh, damn, I didn't get to finish my visualization because I actually was yeah. too relaxed. Maybe there were some things going on in the day. I wasn't, you know, as sharp mentally as I could to be able to hold in that zone and actually control, you know, my uh, my mental processes while I'm in that super relaxed state. Right, right. No, for sure. Um no, that's interesting. And, and so Laredo, uh, that's awesome. He's an athlete here in the group. Uh, he's taken the Mindset 101 and he, he asked, do you visualize specific skills you are working on or just larger goals? And I, I think you kind of touched on that a little bit saying, I mean, probably you would do both, but I'll let you handle that question. Yeah. So like I said, the first part is me. I built this, uh, you know, room in my head that has all these pictures where every single time, 100% of the time, I throw up a picture of what my short term is. Usually that's something I want to accomplish in a week or two. It can be something like, you know, I want to train five times. So I'll, I'll see a picture of myself in my gym, you know, getting a good, you know, workout on my midterm goal might be, okay, there's a tournament uh, next month. I want to win that tournament. All right. Then my long term goal would be something, you know, like I want to win a BC championship or I want to, you know, win nationals. I want to, you know, go to worlds. Uh, I want to go to worlds this year and, and finish top three. Like it's a ridiculous thing again, because I'm playing now against guys. Uh, I, you know, Ivan Lendl's hitting partner, you know, like these guys are pros. These guys, you know, came up through our junior national uh, tennis program, went off and played, you know, junior uh, French Open, junior U.S. Open. Like these are good players that are still playing, you know, into their uh, 30s and 40s. And that's who I'm competing against now. But somehow I'm doing it, you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm doing it on two lessons a year and uh, working on my own. Right. And using and using your and using your visualization. Well, how, what about the skills though, that he's talking about? Like, say you're visualizing your forehand or maybe these guys, yeah. hockey guys, you mean they're you know, a, a wrist shot or some one timer or something like that. Yeah. Can you can you use can you do you recommend your clients use this for, for that skill development as well? 100%. So that last part, you know, when I talked about visualizing for your sport, you can either do it. So before a game, I would actually visualize the game. So I'm playing, you know, if we're playing Spokane, I'm playing Spokane in my head. There's the red jerseys. There's Padolin. There's Bure. You know, there's dude, there's, I'm seeing everything. But you can also run a practice. And I tell the kids this all the time. If you get two hours of practice a week on the ice, okay, you can visualize for 15 minutes a night. And the 15 minute visualization, you could get an hour or an hour and a half equivalent practice crunched into that time. I've become really efficient at that 
because in your head, time doesn't run linear like one second, two seconds. I can speed through things. So I could do an hour practice in seven to 10 minutes. Yeah. And like you said, you know, that's a program that I'm building my brain. Your body cannot tell the difference. Your brain cannot tell the difference between doing the thing, actually stick handling, or yeah. if you hooked me up to, uh, you know, the, uh, the brain reader, my brain is going to react the exact same if I'm visualizing or doing the skill. So you can practice your stick handling. You can practice your shooting. You can practice your skating. You can practice your gameplay, edge work. You name it. Now, here's the key is that when you are visualizing, you are always doing it perfect. Right. You are never, ever visualizing screw ups because if you're visualizing that, when it comes down to, you know, you playing the thing, you don't want to have trip ups. You don't yeah. want to, you know, so when you visualize say you that. the skills, yeah, perfect. visualize it perfect, but they, that's what were the advantages. And that's why these studies, when you dig yeah. in and why they work, is because your skill set might not be able to do the thing you want to do. Exactly. Right. But when you can see it, you can do it. Right. And so the more you can see it, and, the, and that's why I love when you're talking about watching the videos, you mentioned that a couple of times. I watched a video. I, wa- I watched it, see it done perfectly by a professional. So now I know what that's supposed to look like and I can imagine what it feels like. And now your body's making the adjustments to be able to do that. So if you, if you can't do a toe drag or a saucer pass, if you watch somebody do it, now you're feeling your hands do it. You don't have the stick in your hand. That's the best part because as soon as you have the stick in your hand, you can't do it. So it gets frustrating. But if you are working on that in your brain and doing it perfectly, that's when your muscles start to figure it out on their own without you even knowing that they're figuring it out. That's the beauty of it. Crosby's already figured all this out. Why wouldn't I just watch him and then put my face on his body? You know, my legs in the same position. My arms are in the same position. I'm, you know, got that strong crossover, whatever I'm doing. It's like, it's already done for me. All I got to do is watch the damn thing, you know, a few times, lock it into my head and then visualize it. And then I'll bet your clients, a couple of those kids get out there and do it. And I bet you the first time you try some of those skills after visualizing it about 10 times, you're going to nail it and it's going to blow your mind. No, that's the thing. And, and the thing is, I mean, you've, you've had some, I mean, originally you had some really amazing results with it, right? So that's really, it helps with the buy-in process, but I just, I want to put the, the disclaimer out there that it, this is a skill like anything else, right? Like it doesn't always happen overnight and it takes repetition to figure out what works. It takes working with somebody like you to help you get down the road, you know, to know that you're not making mistakes along the way and, and being consistent with the practice to help yourself get better. So, you know, of course we encourage, I want you guys to experiment with it. You you guys watching this video, right? Experiment with it. See what works. But, you know, don't be super like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, this is going to work for me tomorrow. You know, I'm going to do this tonight and tomorrow on the ice, I'm going to be Mario Lemieux, right? It it doesn't, it doesn't work quite like that, but, um, but be consistent and, and keep being curious and things are going to happen. I would Um, say just one thing for, for most guys that I've worked with, it takes about five times like i think you know that first one that i did for the you know junior golf i did it yeah. first time you know i i think i might have had like a little uh you know extra ability to be able to do that because some guys have a tough time even seeing the pictures in their head right. that's why it's helpful if you have somebody talking and actually walking you through the game so i you know if it's a defenseman i'll do say 10 defensive skills defenseman skills and i will walk them through every process from the relaxation to the goal setting and then i will have like three written sheets out where i'm like again face-offs in the d zone you're in the center lined up against the winger pucks one back to the corner to your d-man you hold up the guy he starts to wheel the net you push off Defenseman go off into the other corner, receive a D to D pass off the wall. You immediately cushion that puck, get your head up, start taking strides, and hit the centerman who's curled into the zone. And now you're heading up the ice. And then again, it's always success. You always make tape to tape passes. You know you're always making the plays, and you're scoring lots of goals. <laughs> yeah, no, that's super cool. And the more detail, the better. And I mean, the that was more one of the detail, questions. the better. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the questions my wife asked, and I. Uh, 
you know, what was is more detailed, the better. And you've already said it. I mean, you said if, if you can involve, involve, the more yeah. senses you can involve, the better, right? The more real it is to you. And again, that that part is a skill because it is harder for some people, right, to to get all those senses involved. And the more you practice, the better you get at it. Some people can really see in vibrant colors and, you know, they can feel textures and they can smell aromas in their, I mean, that's not everybody the first time, right? But we, we all have the ability to get there. So you got to be patient with yourself. Um, one more thing I'll say before we go here is um, one of the questions was also, is this something you can do during a game? And uh, and Danny Briere in that interview, which I will recommend everyone listen to again, uh, said that he would. And it's something that I've incorporated the practice with with great success with the players that I work with. And and uh, I call it rewind, replay, reset. And I don't know, like, what if you have a little uh, term there or for something you use? But it was, it's the idea of getting to the bench, rewinding it in your brain, right? So you get back to that spot, you know what you did wrong. Now you replay it as visually and as accurately as you can with what you would have wanted to do, and then it's reset. It's been done properly, right? I've learned from it. I knew what I was supposed to do, and now you can move forward. So my, you know, the thing that I did during games, I called it my three breaths. And so I'd come back after a hard shift and you'd usually be like, you know, and I would yeah. take three distinct breaths like, and by the third breath, I'd always be back down to center. Like it was programmed in my head that I only need three breaths to get back right down. And then I was back to calm. And then if something happened that shift or I need to make an adjustment during the game, sometimes, well, for instance, I remember actually doing one at Buffalo camp playing against McGilney. I never played against a guy who had that much speed and strength laterally. His crossover steps were so big that he tripped me up. You know, the first time he came down, I thought I had good speed. He took a giant leap and luckily he lost the puck, yeah. you know, but he beat me with one big step. And I'm like, okay, I need to adjust to this. This guy has speed and strength that I've never seen before. I need to back off. I need to get a little bit lower and I need to react to his body a little bit quicker. And uh, actually that game, I remember he came down on me twice more and uh, and I stopped him. And I was like, man, I just stopped one of the best players in the NHL. Yeah, <laughs> yeah super cool. Um, so I think that, well, that takes our hour. So for everyone who's on here still and for those who watch later, uh, what I plan on doing here is moving this group forward and bringing... Uh, bringing an element to the group where we can get into a membership type scenario where we're going to bring somebody like Cal back into the group for those who want to participate, where he'll actually give a master class on visualization. So the athletes that are involved um, can come tune in. Uh, Cal will lay out, you know, kind of the, the foundation, fundamental aspects of, of what it is uh, to use visualization properly uh, and specifically for your sport and for what you want to do. And, uh, and you can get right into the weeds, you know? So like this is intended to be one informational and we learned a lot today. So Cal, thanks for, for coming out, right? To un understand what's going on, get people used to you. And, um, and just like the nutritionist that we had on before and just like the strength and conditioning coach and just like McKenzie with the skills that will add an element of a masterclass in with the membership uh, portion. So, uh, so yeah, so if you guys enjoyed this, um, there's definitely more where this came from. Cal said that he'd love to come back and, and share some of his stuff with us. Uh, so Cal, once again, thanks so much. I love that you've used this yourself. I love that you're helping others do it. And, um, sorry, I didn't mention the name of your, of your company. What's the name of your company again? Uh, Evolution Sport Consulting. And if anyone wants to get a hold of me, uh, they can either, uh, through evolution sport at live.ca or my name, Cal Benazic at hotmail.com or phone number 250-859-6451. And uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I, it's something I enjoy now is giving back to athletes. I not only personal train, but I also do uh, visualization. And I honestly have to say that everyone who's come in and bought in and done some sessions has had success. I helped a guy get back into the NHL after, you know, getting pounded down to the minors. Um, two tennis uh, players that were top juniors here in town that had never won on the BC uh, circuit themselves ended up winning uh, tournaments the first year after they tried it. So uh, it's it, it's one of those things where it's hard to tell people how important if they don't know how important this is. Yeah. But 
it's a hundred percent success when you do it. It's yeah. it, it's a game changer. It doesn't hurt. I mean, that's the, that's the guaranteed not to hurt and, and definitely going to help you uh, succeed. And one, it, as we talked about earlier, it helps with that confidence and that idea that you're doing a little extra, you know, you, you're the type of person, the type of athlete that's going to, that's going to take whatever opportunity they can find to find that advantage. And even knowing that, that walking into a competition can be massively beneficial. So thanks so much. So yeah, so more to come from Cal. Um, lots of, lots of great feedback here. Wow. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Very enlightening. Thank you so much. So, um, really great that you were able to be here. Thanks so much everyone tuning in again. Um, really love sharing with these young athletes. I mean, as Cal said, to, to be on the other side of this now and to understand from a different place, like what can benefit uh, young athletes, what's going to help them speed up their timeline, you know, like to not have to go through some of the walls that Cal and I had went through, um, you know, to, to learn, right? That's the idea of mentorship. That's the type of deal of giving back and, and finding coaches that, uh, you know, that can help you get to where you want to go. So I hope this was beneficial for most of you out there. I know that visualization still is something that's misunderstood and, and, and kind of unutilized, although it is becoming more mainstream. So yes, athletes, get after it. F find, uh, find your way. And uh, you might be able to find that way with Cal here in the next couple of weeks as we bring him back in for a master class. So awesome, Cal. We'll sign off. Um, and until uh, next time, guys, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you later. Thanks, Jay.